Welcome here to Seismic Radio and uh, for another session here at uh, at Seismic uh, Radio. Uh, we are today looking at um, probably the last tape from John Noble's library. It's um, um, a talk by Dr. Bob Gordon, Reverend Dr. God Bob Gordon. And uh, uh, just to explain where, where these talks are all coming from, and, and you can see a lot on the YouTube channel, if you go to seismicradio.org and you click on John Noble's library, you can see about 200 talks. This this talk will, uh, just the audio version of this talk will be uploaded as well uh, very soon. Okay, uh, what have we got? We have got um, John Noble. John Noble is the founder of the Pioneer Movement. He has done... Um, um, sort of a lot of work in the past on, I think it's the house church movement, pioneer movement, and um, was looking after a lot of uh, churches and uh, groups and uh, and so on. Um, one of the things he did in the past is he had a, a bit of a, a, a mail order Christian uh, literature stroke bookshop stroke audio shop, and um, he, when he went to events where he was speaking, um, but very often he was recording the events and he got the tapes and he uh, again distributed them via his uh, his outlet. Uh, obviously, we, we are now looking uh, about 30 years ago, so that's like in the in the early 80s. And um, actually, it's more, isn't it? It's 84. Um, yeah, it's uh, 30, almost 35 years. Uh, yeah, not far off. Um, so anyway, 34 years or so, 33, 34 years. So, um, he, uh, was distributing those tapes and, and obviously those tapes, uh, they were stored for years and years and years. And a few years ago, uh, probably about five, six years ago, he started clearing them out. And, uh, when he heard about uh, what we were doing at Seismic Radio, he let us have those tapes for free. Initially, I didn't even notice them. Um, somebody just dropped them off, and they, they ended up on some shelf. And, and then, I think it was about uh, about three years ago, I uh, discovered them. I had a lot of time on my hands, um, and so I started digitizing those tapes uh, one by one. And, uh, and now we are using them here uh, for Seismic Radio as well, and make them available to the public. So this is a blast from the past, a recording from 1984. The event was, uh, was in Newark which is in Nottinghamshire, so that's Robin Hood country uh, here in England, and it was the so-called Kingdom Faith Family Week. So if uh, you happen to tune in and you remember from 30 years ago, uh, who knows, you might have been there. Uh, now the talks, um, as I said before, supplied by courtesy of John Noble, rescued from the dumpster, and uh, and and some of the talks are really great jewels, and uh, it's quite interesting as well because when you sort of look at the uh, the framework of the time and and uh, what was going on within the church, the way people were thinking, some of the end time talks are really really interesting, and then obviously with the benefit of hindsight, we can see back and there's been quite a bit of a cultural shift as well, and uh, of what was happening. Um, okay, uh, that's all. Now to Bob Gordon. The big problem is I all I get is just a tiny, tiny bit of information, uh, Reverend Bob Gordon, and I just listened to the talk as well. So when you digitize a talk, uh, I, I don't tend to be able to listen to it. So I just took it up to the computer. The talk gets digitized. Um, and so I was just sort of uh, turning it on whilst I was doing some cleaning here at the, in my house, and I was actually so captivated, I, I stopped my cleaning efforts uh, which I'm not a great fan of, fan of anyway, and I sat down and listened to the talk, uh, not in its entirety, but to the first half of the talk, and it was about um, listening to the voice of God. You know, you get some revelation from God, what to do with it, you know, take it all or test it, and obviously the answer is you test it with the Bible, against the Bible, what does the Bible say, how does the revelation, the personal revelation you've got from God or from somebody else tie up with what the Bible says, and um, how do you deal with this? Yeah, he talks a little bit about heresies. You know, heresies are very often personal revelation or some sort of revelation which goes over and beyond what the Bible says, or it takes some stuff away from what the Bible says. And then the second half of the talk, equally interesting, uh, he looks at the Old Testament. I understand that, that Bob Gordon is a Hebrew scholar. From I, I tried to find some information on him, and I hope I got the right guy. Um, I'm going to show you the website in a minute. And I did listen to some of the audio on the website, and the voice seems to be the same. But I'll show you the website, you can judge it yourself, and I'm pretty sure it's, a, it's the same guy. Uh, you know, the picture you can see here on the, on the slide. 
Okay, so um, Old Testament, he gives you a timeline from Genesis all the way to uh, Malachi, and it's actually quite interesting. So if you're new to the Bible and the Old Testament and you struggle a little bit sort of putting it all into context, it's actually a very good guide to go through it. So that's part two. So if you... You're not interested in the revelation bit, just go to about, you know, on if, if you're listening on YouTube or you've got the audio file, just um, go sort of about halfway through and uh, and then he starts talking about the uh, the Old Testament, how it's organized. A very, very interesting talk, really interesting talk. Okay, let me just go to the website. Um, Dr. Bob Gordon, he went to be with the Lord in 1997. And um, somebody put up a website, I'm not sure who it is, whether it's his family or somebody else, uh, and it's called www.bob-gordon.com. And I'm just uh, going to go there to the website, so bear with me. So we have got the website here. That's the website, uh, Living Legacy Bob Gordon. If you're on YouTube, uh, you can listen to it. If you are on, um, if you're listening via the radio station, um, you know, just uh, just check it out yourself. Go to uh, again www bob minus gordon dot com. Yeah, www bob minus gordon dot com. So that's all it is. Uh, there's a little bit of an introduction to the man, uh, but actually not that much information. Most of the information I tried to uh, pick up on uh, the internet. There's a seems to be a Facebook page of uh, him as well. Uh, where some of the stuff is uploaded, bearing in mind that more people probably check out Facebook than uh, go on the on the web. Um, and then uh, there's something called Master Builders Trust. I'm not sure who and what this is, but then here's the interesting bit. Um, a lot of his talks, um, so we've got Church End Times, Faith in Action, For We See Jesus, Strangers on Earth, The Kingdom of God, The Presence and the Power, The Real Thing, The Winning Sight, uh, the witness of the spirit touching the fire. So these are the talks which are which are there. I, I I can't endorse them. I haven't listened to all of them. I've just tuned into one to check out whether the voice ties up with the uh, with the talk I've got uh, from 1984. And it seems to be very similar. Uh, both of them have got a Scottish accent, so I think it's the same person. Uh, but I, I tuned into one of the talks a little bit, and it 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 actually is quite interesting. And I think in uh, days or times to come, I'll probably spend a bit more time on this website to check out uh, Reverend or Dr. Bob Gordon. Uh, we've got some notes as well on the website. Just a very tiny, straightforward website, a little bit of information about the guy, but I think the um, the key thing, it looks like there are some printed sermons or something, uh, preaching notes, that's what it's called, preaching notes. You can find them here. Uh, I'm just trying to get into this. Can I get into them? Uh, loading? Uh, no, that's uh, Preacher and Ewart. Okay, so you can get his preaching notes as well, which are sort of getting published bit by bit. Um, yeah, okay, there are handwritten preaching notes, which he uses. Uh, <laughs> obviously, we are talking the 90s, and uh, by the time he probably was quite old. Uh, uh, so, handwritten preaching notes. Very, very interesting, actually. It's worthwhile to check out the website, so I would encourage you to uh, spend some time and go there. No, no, first listen to the uh, sermon, which will... Uh, from 1984, which comes right after here. And then uh, when you've got some time, go to bobminusgordon.com and check it out. Okay, you're listening to Seismic Radio. It's been a pleasure to have you um, to have you here on YouTube or on the radio station, depending where you're listening to. And uh, I'll pass it over, hand it over to um, a sermon about listening to the voice of God and then um, a timeline of the Old Testament. And um, And I think... That's all, yeah. So enjoy. Um, bye bye. He has the strength to obey your word. And we ask that we might not be hearers of it only, but doers of the same. So, Lord, be with us now, we pray. Give us that special unction, anointing of your Holy Spirit, that we might live and glorify your holy name for Jesus' sake. Amen. Turn to Exodus 3 this morning as we start. Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> there are seats this way, if you want to come this way.
Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was in fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are say to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. You'll notice just a technical thing, that God met Moses at the mountain called Horeb, and that Moses met God on the mountain called Sinai. Do you remember that, huh? Uh, the name interchanges, but the name changes. But God met Moses at a mountain and took him on an adventure of faith into Egypt and then brought him back to the mountain in the desert. Jamie Buckingham has written a remarkable book. Um, I've just forgotten the exact title of it at the moment. Either Through the Wilderness, I think it's called Through the Wilderness, and it's on the bookshop. I was commending it to some people yesterday. I hope it's sold out by today because I got a free copy sent to me recently by my publishers because I was doing a book on the wilderness myself. And it's a lovely book because it grows out of the experience of Jamie Buckingham, who, um, who wrote the book about those experiences in his own life that we could describe as wilderness experiences. And I believe that's a, a part of life's experience we need to take very seriously because God teaches us many things in the wilderness. Uh, he wrote the book because for six years or more he has each year led a, a walking party of only a dozen men or so into the wilderness of Sinai. And he knows that wilderness intimately. He has walked uh, the, the path of Moses. And he, he's visited every place uh, that's mentioned in the Old Testament wanderings of the people of God. I commend the book to you. Uh, it's very interesting as a spiritual experience. It's exceedingly interesting as an introduction at first hand to the lie of the land as far as the Old Testament is concerned in the book of Exodus. And if you've ever been in puzzlement about what it must have been like, then go and buy or get a borrow of Jamie Buckingham's book called Through the Wilderness. I think it's published by Kingsway, is it? Uh, I think it's by Kingsway, and it's just published this year. But um, you should look at it, because it's, it's worth the bother. Now, I want to ask the question this morning to start. Remember yesterday morning we asked the question, why do we need to look at the Bible at all? Why do we study the Bible? I want to ask a fairly important question to begin this morning about revelation. What is revelation? Now, of course, I'm speaking initially about revelation in the Bible, in the Scriptures. Uh, we've become, it's become popular to speak of revelation today in our own hearts. Um, 
quite remarkable this morning that uh, the Lord led me to preach on the river from Ezekiel and uh, at least two or three people in the eight o'clock or whatever time in the morning you meet together had actually words from the Lord this morning about the river of God one way or another. A woman actually wrote it down and gave it to me via Charles Sibson after I had preached. I had no clue of that before I spoke but you see that's revelation uh, working in immediate terms and we use the word revelation to speak of the mechanism of God declaring himself or declaring his word. We use the word revelation to speak of the mechanisms of God revealing himself, declaring himself or declaring his word. And in our own day we've come to understand a lot about revelation in what we would call first hand terms, haven't we? That is through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, through vision, through dream, through prophetic word, through immediate uh, activity of the Holy Spirit. Do you follow what I mean? So if I said to you, what is revelation in those terms, maybe that's how you would answer me, is it? You would maybe say to me, well, it's God speaking, would you? And you would maybe give me some examples of God speaking, how he's given you a message to write down or a gift of prophecy or a dream or a vision or an experience of revelation. You might say that revelation is direction. Would you say that to me? That what we're looking for today is revelation. Huh? That is, we want to know where to go or what to do for God. Would you agree with that? So, you see, we don't have a lot of trouble in understanding one aspect of revelation. What I want to call the immediate aspect, if you like, in experimental terms. What I want to talk to you this morning about is the whole idea of revelation in the scripture. Because it's a very multicoloured thing and it's beautiful. And if we can understand how God reveals himself and what it means to say about revelation then it will enlarge our appreciation of what God is doing today in the Holy Spirit. Do you follow me? So what do we mean by revelation? It's quite clear, isn't it, when you read Exodus chapter 3, that here we have an experience of revelation. Yes? Right. Well, I want to start there for a moment. Because in the scriptures, revelation operates at at least three different levels. Okay? It operates at at least three different levels. Exodus 3 is an example of one important level. Shall I say the first important level, right? Because in the Bible we have a number of records of God revealing himself. Haven't we? We have Isaiah 6, we've got Ezekiel 1, we've got John on the island of Patmos, we've got Paul on the Damascus road. We've got a whole number, we've got Abraham, we've got Jacob, we've got a whole number of instances which are left on record in Holy Writ of God manifesting himself. And so the first aspect of revelation, what we mean by revelation first, is God revealing himself personally. Okay? God revealing himself personally. That's a tremendous miracle. That the God of eternity reveals himself personally. And Exodus chapter 3 that we've read this morning and Exodus chapter 6 are two outstanding occasions left on record in the Holy Scripture of God's personal revelation. And so when we speak of revelation, we are talking of something that's personal. And that's important, you see. Uh, we do that with each other. We manifest ourselves to one another. It's a gift of personality that you can choose to hide yourself or to disclose yourself, isn't it? You see, you can meet me out there or wherever, you meet me sometimes, and I will choose not to disclose myself. Because if I did it to everybody after a meeting, I would be, I would be uh, out of my wits by the time I got back to my tent to get a wash. Do you follow me? So there have to be times in my personality, whereas as a real person, I choose not to disclose. I will say hello, I'll be polite, I will shake your hand, I'll do all sorts of things, but I will not enter into self-disclosure. You know, that's the great secret of falling in love. Falling in love is two people deciding mutually to self-disclose themselves. Huh? It's a good technical description of it, anyhow. Yeah? <laughs> the way they get up to it, it's a different thing now. <laughs> but uh, you follow what I mean? It's two people deciding in their will that they want to be free enough with this other person to unreservedly enter into an experience of self-disclosure. I mean, that's why marriage goes wrong and relationship doesn't build up, because some folk try to have a love relationship without self-disclosure, and you can't do it. You can't do it. So the Holy Spirit has got to heal us so often so that we are able or willing to disclose ourselves. So Revelation has got this thing. God is a person. Now, I don't want to be mundane, I don't mean that he's like you and me, he's not in the locus of a body, but he is personal. 
The great thing that the scripture says about God, the chief thing that the Bible tells us about God is that he is person with a capital P. In fact, what the Bible says, according to Genesis, is that inasmuch as we are persons, our personhood is derived from God's personhood. He is person with a capital P, and we are person with a small p. He is spirit with a capital S, and we are spirit with a small s. The spirit, capital S, bears witness with our spirit, small s, that we are children of God. What happens when a believer is born again? The Holy Spirit comes in, but it's, it's a meeting, it's an encounter between divine person and human person. It's person to person. It's self-disclosure. And when you open your heart to God, it's you choosing to allow God to have what he already knows, to disclose yourself, to open yourself out to God. And that's revelation, see? And so the Bible is full of instances of what we mean by revelation. And what we mean chiefly by revelation is God making himself known. Not marvellous. He hasn't hidden himself. He's declared himself. See? Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, because how God declares himself determines what we think of Revelation. I'll come back to that in a moment. So, Exodus chapter 3, we read this morning, to demonstrate the principle that God is a God of self-disclosure, and that Revelation is personal. The second element of Revelation that's important to see, and I'm sorry if I'm being a bit technical, but I think this will enlarge your thinking, it will put some things into focus, yes? The second element of revelation is that revelation in the Bible is not only personal, it's not only God disclosing himself, and we have the record of that, it is event and interpretation. The second thing, in other words, you find in the Bible are things that happen in the power of God and are explained then by the Spirit of God. Do you follow me? Uh, We could take many uh, illustrations of that, but if you take Moses again... You have the event of the Exodus. See? Now, as far as the Egyptian news at 10 was concerned, when the Exodus happened, or they lost a few Egyptian soldiers in the flood and all the rest of it, but actually it was really, from their point of view, one of a number of nomadic bands fleeing from Egypt. At that time in Egyptian history, there were a whole number of people in slavery, not only the Hebrews. And the Hebrew, as far as the settled Egyptian civilization was concerned, the Hebrew nomads fled. They got out of it, right? And there was a bit of a shamozzle. It caused a a seven-day wonder. As far as God was concerned, the Exodus was a salvation event. And that's how it's interpreted in Scripture and how it's declared to Moses. And God is at mighty work liberating his people. And the great thing about the Exodus event is it not only is it explained in the time of Moses as a salvation event, it is actually, it's recalled time and time again through the Old Testament. In 587, when the people go into exile in Babylon, their return from exile, Isaiah chapter 40, their return from exile is seen as a second Exodus. So this event, this event is um, a very powerful event which is explained in salvation terms. And so we have revelation by event and its interpretation. I mean, what is the New Testament? The New Testament is an event and its, expe- and its interpretation. The event of Jesus. Chiefly, the event of the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And you could say, in one sense, the whole of the New Testament, starting with the Acts of the Apostles, is the interpretation of the death and the rising of Jesus. Would you agree with that? You see what I mean? That that God has done something in history, and then he has interpreted it. That's divine salvation history. Here come the Russians again. We must have a, a, a word with the Air Force next year and get them to kind of divert their exercises. You get it with, for example, the cross of Christ. Paul is the great interpreter of the cross of Christ. On the day of Pentecost, you get Peter standing up, and there is an event, you see. There has been an event. 120 people have been in an upper room. They have been baptized with tongues of fire. They speak in tongues, they praise the Lord, and they go out and they start singing and dancing and praising the Lord in the temple precincts. That needs some explanation because it didn't normally happen. And the first evangelistic sermon wasn't laid on. They didn't put posters around the town and say, come and hear the great uh, international evangelist Peter. He's going to preach the gospel. Peter stood up in the middle of the event. 
And people were saying, what's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? Are these fellows drunk? What's happening? So Peter says, these men are not drunk as you suppose. That's how he started his sermon. This is what has been prophesied by the prophet Joel. In the last days your young men shall see, etc., etc., etc. That I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. You see, the first Pentecostal sermon is an interpretation or an explanation of a God event. <laughs> and so the second level of biblical revelation is of event and its interpretation. And that's important to see. You can think, if you'll think of your own Bible for a moment, uh, you can think of a whole number of instances of the first level where God reveals himself, can't you? You can think of a, a, an even greater number of instances of event taking place and its interpretation. Right through the prophets and all the rest of it. That is event and interpretation. You know, I, I'll give you a little hint to understand your Bible for a moment at one point. Even what God has still to do has been laid down in Scripture in event interpretation terms. That was a thing that the Old Testament prophets indulged in called prophetic symbolism. I alluded to that this morning, where Ezekiel was told by God to do a number of things. One of the things he was told by God to do was to take a slate and to draw a picture of the holy city on the slate and to lie in front of it bound hand and foot. Do you, you remember that? Yeah. Do you? That was prophetic symbolism. You say, what do I mean by prophetic symbolism? I mean that the prophet had to be involved in an event, right? His very doing of the event pointed to a greater event. Because what Ezekiel was doing was saying, just as I'm lying in front of this slate bound like this, so God is going to bring the power of Babylon against Jerusalem. You remember that? And the small symbol in which the prophet was involved was speaking of a larger event which came to pass. Now, the thing about it is this, it's just not the prophet doing something that then is reflected in a greater something. What is happening is that when the prophet enters into the symbol, it's like the first step of its fulfillment. The day Ezekiel lay in front of the slate was the day that God secured the event happening. It was as good as happened at that point. Do you follow what I mean? You see, to give you another example from the New Testament, Jesus did the same. Jesus took a donkey one day and he rode into Jerusalem and the people took palm branches and they said hail to him who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you remember that? See? Yes. Well, you see, that event has not yet, the, the symbol of Ezekiel has been fulfilled. God came against Jerusalem in the Babylonians. But the event or the symbol of Jesus riding on the donkey has not yet been fulfilled because the donkey was the, the symbol to the Jews of kingship. The Jews never used horses to be a king. It was Solomon who uh, introduced horses into the kingdom, but the mule or the ass was the divine, was the, the monarch's uh, beast in ancient Israel. And when Jesus took uh, uh, an ass, the prophet says, you know, um, I've forgotten the actual text, but, um, you know, humble and lowly is he who comes riding upon an ass. I've not quoted it right, but you know the one I mean, don't you? As soon as Jesus did that, Jesus was proclaiming the beginning of something. Now, what was it that Jesus was actually proclaiming the beginning of? Eh? His what? No, nah, it wasn't just his kingdom. Yes, his kingdom, but that's not just right. Not at that point. There was a specific, a second coming. He was going to come into the city. He was going to come to earth as king. And the reason you and I can be sure that Jesus is coming as king manifest before the nations is because on one day he took an ass and he rode into Jerusalem. The fulfillment, the actual process of his second coming was begun in that moment. Huh? Do you follow me? It's not just like a, an isolated him thing, him saying, I'll now give you a little picture of what it will be like one day. I shall now ride on a, on a donkey into Jerusalem, and I'll do that, and then we'll wait for the fulfillment. As far as God's concerned, prophecy and fulfillment are totally linked in this prophetic symbolism. That... Jesus is going to be king before all the nations just as surely as he set his, the thing in motion that day by riding on an ass into Jerusalem. Do you follow me? I'll give you another example. And this, I hope, will open your eyes to what you do every week, some of you. If you do it every week, I hope you do it every week. And I hope you're not a Presbyterian and only do it every quarter. That's Holy Communion. See? Now, you say, what was Jesus doing there? He took a bread and he took a wine and he, he, took, uh, he made a supper and he said, do this in remembrance of me. See? He says, I, he wasn't just giving us a little thing for which, with which to look pack, back. It was prophetic symbolism. As soon as Jesus broke the bread, his body was as good as broken on the cross. Do you follow me? Huh? Yeah. 
As soon as Jesus spilt the wine, gave them the wine to drink, it was as good as his blood. Jesus, the event was sealed in that moment. It wasn't just a little kind of promise, this is what it's going to be like. It wasn't just, this is as if my body is broken. It was God saying, this is my body broken. And from that moment, of course from before that, but from that moment at least, the, the, the symbol and the event were absolutely linked together. It's called prophetic symbolism. Jesus was entering into the experience of Calvary when he broke that bread. It was prophetic. And so it, it, it contains all that depth for us as we break bread and drink wine. Do you follow that? Huh? Now, you see, that's a very deep thing. The, the whole idea of revelation being event and its interpretation is a very profound thing, and the scripture is full of it. Huh? Now, I'm sorry this morning it's a bit heavy and technical, but I hope it's, uh, it's something that will uh, lead you into your understanding of the scripture. Uh, am I making sense? Yes. I'm a bit tired, I'm at the end of a long run, but you tell me if I'm making sense, because I want to lead you through this, it's just important. Huh? Firstly, revelation is personal, right? And all, in the scriptures we have the record of God revealing himself. Secondly, revelation is event and interpretation. Thirdly, thirdly, revelation is what I want to call word proposition. Word stroke proposition. What I mean by that is that in the Bible we have a third level of, inter of revelation. It's not a personal appearing of God. It's not a salvation event with its interpretation. What it is, is actually a statement from God about something. A, a great example of that are the, is the Decalogue, huh? where God says, this is the word. Huh? Um, in, uh, in some of the, the Hebrew Bible, of course, doesn't call, uh, the Hebrew Bible doesn't call uh, the biblical books by the same names as we've got them. Our names are kind of invented names. Deuteronomy doesn't really do it. It, it really, um, the, 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 the book of Deuteronomy is called in the Hebrew Bible, Ele Hadivrim. Uh, these are the words, huh? Because it's a delivery, if you like, through Moses of the words of God to the people of Israel before they enter into the promised land, right? See? And, um, and uh, that's propositional. It's God making a statement. Huh? Do, do you follow me? Just the same as God giving the law. It's God making a statement. He says, this is what I desire in your life. Thou shalt worship the Lord, the God, etc., etc. He didn't actually say, praise the Lord, thou shalt worship the Lord. He said it in Hebrew or something else. That's uh, King James Version English. But you follow what I mean, huh? It's important to see that God actually said definitive things. I've already said to you, even the New Testament, in terms of holiness and power in our lives, I believe that God has almost said definitively, propositionally, 98% of all we need to hear. Huh? And a lot of our flapping around in life is because we ignore the fact that God has actually said something. Huh? How often have you lived your Christian life wishing that God would say something and not realizing that he has said something? How often have you done that? You know, I don't want to be awful rude, but I happened to be reading during somebody else's sermon the other day, um, the book of Corinthians, just uh, one of these little wonders I had. I'm sure you do the same during mine, so I won't blame you for that. But I'm happy to read 1 Corinthians 7. Now, for goodness sake, don't turn to it now. It's, we've had enough contentious uh, subjects this week, and this is the most contentious one. It's all about whether you should get married or divorced or not divorced or all the rest of it, yeah? I read 1 Corinthians 7, and I was astounded at the clarity of it. That's all I want to tell you. I was astounded at the clarity of it. And I thought, I wonder why I've been in doubt about certain things. Do you understand? We face a real problem here today as to whether we take our moods and standards from the mood of society and the world around us or whether we actually take it from the Word of God. Eh? Don't we? I was actually, when I read 1 Corinthians 7 in the New International, I'm just reading through my New International at the moment because I've read through every other version and being interested in words, I want to see how it puts things. Do you follow me? And I was amazed at the clarity of 1 Corinthians 7. I was also amazed at the realism of it, huh? about what believers and unbelievers are free or free not to do. Huh? I was absolutely astounded. It actually solved some very practical problems I've just been speaking with people about recently. And I thought, is it true I've never read that before? I don't know if you understand what I'm feeling after this morning. I suddenly dawned on me that God had actually said something about the thing. Huh? Just the same as, you know, I've had to deal a lot in my life. Now, this is another contentious subject, I'm sorry. But I was a university chaplain for eight years of my life. And uh, I, I was a staff of the University of Durham. And I had to deal with a great number of people becoming Christians in very, very difficult circumstances. And I, I dealt a lot with what I would call for you this morning wayward sexuality. Huh? See? 
And of course, um, I've, I, I mean, I've got one other URC minister here this morning who knows what I'm talking about because we've been involved in counselling and this kind of thing one way or another quite a lot here and there. And we tend to take our reference point from the latest kind of perspective, sociologically or philosophically or psychologically, whatever the hell else it is, you know, on a thing. And I sat and read the scriptures of the thing, and I was amazed again, firstly at the black and whiteness of the thing, but also at certain parts on the, on the sympathy of the thing, you know, see? I mean, it is very tough, it's very straightforward, but it is also very loving, you know? And when I read that, it changed my whole approach to the question of how I dealt with people in those situations. In other words, what I'm saying to you is when I understood that revelation included word proposition, it had a dynamic effect. It, the first, what I will say to you is now when I'm counselling or looking for an answer to anything, the first place I go is to the scriptures. You see? Now, often God takes me beyond the scriptures into another little thought through direct revelation, but never does he contradict the scripture. Now, I want to say that just for a moment. I'll just divert for a minute. What is, the, what is the connection between the givenness of revelation in Scripture and the giving of revelation in immediate prophecy? The answer is this, that what we receive through the gifts of the Holy Spirit or through a vision or a dream or any other method, what we receive in the present tense must never contradict the givenness of Scripture. If it contradicts scripture, we have to go back and ask where we got the revelation from. Hmm? Was it yesterday I was telling you that the great failure of heresy, did I tell you? Or was it the last lot? I didn't. Every heresy that's ever been invented has either subtracted from scripture or added to scripture. Yes, I did tell you, see? Uh -huh, it's just a test. No. <laughs> it says myself that can't remember. No. But that's been the failure, you see. Man has subtracted from Scripture or added to Scripture. And I think it behoves us, I believe utterly, in direct revelation. You see? But the thing that I'm frightened of, is, especially when folk come up full of enthusiasm and say, Thus says the Lord, and will neither submit it to other Christians nor to the Holy Word of God. Eh? I'm always suspicious, because if you've got an authentic word from the Lord, it will stand any test that you care to put it to. If it's not authentic, it will evaporate like scotch mist on a sunny morning. And why I'm pushing you to the Bible this week is this. Because I believe there's a, there's a proclivity, we have a tendency today to want immediate revelation and to ignore given revelation. And you see, it appeals to the flesh. Huh? It appeals to the flesh to a young person to be able to come and say, Thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. And I say, now let's sit down and pray about it. Together. Oh, no, no, no. I know the Lord has given it to me. Yeah? You see? And you can make it all sound very pious and very right, but actually at the heart of such a statement are two things. Firstly, there's pride, and secondly, there's fear. And the fear is that when your revelation is tested, somebody either won't agree with it, or it will be seen for what it is, fallacious. Huh? Now, if you've got a real word for the Lord, now I could give you marvellous stories of how Hilda, my wife and myself, have been led by the Lord in direct revelation. I have no doubt, if, you've not, if you doubt what I'm saying this morning, you think I'm being negative, then please go and read the book I've already written, and please read the one I've, I've just written. Yeah? Because they are both full of instances of direct revelation. Absolutely chock-a-block of them. But it's direct revelation that's been thoroughly tested, firstly, in the fire before the throne of God, and secondly, against the standard of God's holy word, huh? the scripture. Because I don't believe God is, at any point of history, I don't believe God will add one jot or tittle to the word that he's given in Jesus. I just don't believe it. I believe, you say, well, why does God give prophecy to God gives direct revelation, and usually it's got to do with circumstantial guidance. I've never yet met divine revelation that adds doctrinally to the teaching of scripture about Jesus. I've met direct revelation, I've met words of prophecy that enhance the scripture. You know, I've got a little computer, I do all my work on a computer at home. I never use a typewriter or paper. Uh, I, I've got this little uh, computer and uh, I do all my books on the computer and correct them and then so that you press a button and it prints once. Now, I've got a thing on my computer called an enhancer. See? It doesn't change the text, it puts a green light up behind it. So that I can, print, I can write a whole page or chapter of text in my computer. And if I want bits enhanced, I can go back through my computer, I press a little button, and it enhances the text. Now what it does on the screen, it puts a green light behind the text that I've enhanced so that it comes up green. You can see it out, it picks it out from all the other text. Do you follow me? And when I press my button to print it, it underlines that bit. It's a good little machine. <laughs> now, 
The thing is, that's what direct revelation does with the revelation of Jesus. It doesn't add to it, it enhances it. So that if God says something to you through prophecy about Christ, it will not be an addition or a contradiction to Scripture, but it will be making it clear or enhanced within your experience, huh? and immediate and relevant. I think we need to see that, because many folk who are suspicious today about the Holy Spirit and the charismatic movement are suspicious at this point. Wouldn't you agree? Huh? Many people have been brought up with the Scriptures, they love the Scriptures, and they don't want the authority of Scripture at any point to be undermined. And I want to say with them this morning, Amen! Amen! But, of course, the way to underline the authority of Scripture is not to be frightened of the gifts of the Spirit, but to use them properly, because the Holy Spirit will witness even further to the authority of Scripture. <laughs> you see? So we don't want to be stuck in the past. We want to live in the immediacy and the power of Revelation. So... These are four princi three principles of revelation that are important. Firstly, revelation is personal. It's about a living God revealing himself into the experience of man. And the scripture is full of the record of that kind of revelation. Now, what does that do for you? For me, it has a great effect and a challenge. The effect is, firstly, that it convinces me that God is a God who reveals himself. Therefore, I look forward to God revealing himself, right? The second thing, it's a challenge. If God could reveal himself to Moses in an immediate and personal way, can God reveal himself to us? Yeah? Now, there's a challenge. Now, let me be saying to you, I don't actually mean by that that I go out and look for a burning bush. Because the mechanism is not the important thing, it's the principle that's important. See? And I have no doubt that we should not get into a kind of gut rot of anxiety about how God's going to do it. One of the things that troubles me sometimes in our search for holiness or in our search for the glory of the Lord to appear, one of the things that just bothers me sometimes is that we don't approach it the biblical way. In the scriptures, God revealed himself how and when he chose, and sometimes we are far too Arminian. Now that's a swear word that most of you won't understand, hallelujah. What I mean by that is even in our search for holiness, far too much we put the emphasis on the human side of it and not the divine side of it. And so we think if we get into the right mood, into the right praise, into the right clearing of the rubble out, God must do his job. God must not do anything. God must not do anything. Charles Finney was the great teacher in revival and Charles Sibsop here is a great fan of Charles S Finney. They're all because they've got the same first name, I don't know. Charles Finney was a great evangelist and a lousy theologian. See? His evangelism was second to none. But the result of his theology led in America to believing that you could have a revival every Tuesday night at 7.30pm. Hmm? Now that's where it went. And what I want to say to you is, we have to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God that in due time he might exalt us, because there's no way you can set the clock to when God will do it. Eh? What we've got to make sure is we're in the right place, in the right heart, the right frame, and to let a sovereign God do his work, because he's a God of revelation. Eh? Now I believe he'll break through far more than we, than we think. Eh? Far more, because everything that the scripture says is my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways, says the Lord. Eh? See, he does far more abundantly than all that we can ask or imagine. Isn't that marvellous? So I'm not contradicting the Holy Spirit renewal or revival. I believe in it utterly. But I believe in it utterly because the Bible teaches me that God is a God of personal revelation. If you seek me with all your heart, you will surely find me. Eh? See? But we find God at his point of self-disclosure. Eh? That's where we find him. It's event and interpretation, it's word and proposition. Now, that's point two. Remember, we're on five points. You remember that, don't you? <laughs> Number one was, we got the need. Number two, what is revelation? Number three then, this is going to be a miracle if we ever hit number five. I didn't do last time, I warn you. They're still wondering what four and five was about. So, no doubt the Lord will reveal it to them. Now, Let's talk thirdly then about the principles of Revelation. How does Revelation work? How does Revelation work in Scripture? And there are four things that I want to tell you here. The first thing I want to say is that as far as the Bible is concerned, Revelation is progressive. Progressive. Now, what do I mean by progressive? 
The Bible starts with God revealing himself intimately to Adam and Eve. Agreed? The Bible continues with that revelation being spoiled and broken. Would you agree with that? And so after the time of Adam and Eve and their sons, we have a period of almost universal darkness. Would you agree with that? Where God is cut off from man and there is no revelation. It's the story of God almost having to start over again. Huh? And into this darkness, he puts his pinpoints of light. Huh? I don't know what names you would identify. Probably Noah you would choose, wouldn't you, as a pinpoint of light in a marvellous way, wouldn't you? And Noah is the continuance of revelation. Noah's light goes through the flood into the other side of the flood. And of course we have other men. Abraham was not the first believer, but chiefly, of course, we have Abraham, don't we? It was the quality of Abraham's faith. God called Abraham. And the light of revelation shines in Abraham. And right through the patriarchs to this point of Moses where the light begins to broaden out. You can see it, can't you? The biblical revelation is like a fan that you begin to unfold. You see one of the bits two of the bits, three of the bits, four of the bits, until we get right round to the time of Jesus and the fan is unfurled in its completeness. Huh? Would you agree with that? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, In times past God spoke in many and varied ways through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, by his son, hallelujah. You see, Christ is the pleroma, is the Greek word. The fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in him. There is no more full revelation of God than we achieve in Jesus. Huh? See, But by the same token, Jesus is the high point or the apex of revelation. Do you follow me? And so there is a progression of revelation. Now, you've got to see that to understand why you get the shades and the darknesses and some of the difficult things in the scriptures. Because they occur within the different movements of revelation. Let me say this. To speak of revelation as progressive, it does not mean that God himself grows any bigger. <laughs> there is a, a modern theology that teaches that God himself starts small, and as the human race grows, so God grows. Huh? That's the truth. There's a whole modern theology. People do PhDs on the ground of that fallacy. See? As an expansionist theology. That's not what we mean by progressive revelation. God is the same, always. Huh? Progressive revelation is governed by man's capacity to receive God. Huh? The thing that made progressive revelation necessary was sin. Huh? Was sin. God created man to live in the fullness of fellowship with him. Would you agree with that? But sin came in, the fall occurred. And it was that event in man's sad history that created the necessity for progressive revelation. And so the Bible is a record of God progressively revealing himself into the lives and experience of man. Not only to degree, but in extent. In other words, we get Abraham, and then we get Abraham's family, then we get the tribes of Israel, then through Israel we get the nations of the world in Christ. See, not only in degree in understanding, but in extent. And it's amazing. You can see the principle of progressive revelation in another way, and it's a marvellous way. You see the principle of uh, progressive revelation because the prophets are given words that not even they fully understand. I mean, we read last night Isaiah 53. I wonder what Isaiah the prophet made of the fact that God gave him words like that to write. Huh? That's what leaves me in awe and wonder, you know. These men were great men of God. And, you know, they knew something that we forget. I think, you know, we live in scientific world, we do. And the, 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 the net result of that, even for those of us who aren't educated to any high degree or aren't scientists, it doesn't matter. The net result of the mood of the society in which we live is that we want to know everything. <laughs> that we want to understand the reason why for everything. Would you agree with that? And the truth is, we don't. We, I happily use my computer every day, and I have the first foggiest notion how it works. <laughs> I mean, I know how to make it work, because I'm, I'm an operator, but I don't know how it works, because I'm not a technician. You see? So there's a fallacy in my pride. Eh? We approach God, and folk won't come to God, because they don't know how he works. They want to know everything. Eh? And yet the fact is, even their Hoover washing machine, they don't know how it works. They just press the button, and bingo, it's whiter than white. <laughs> see? Isn't it? We depend on somebody else's knowledge. Eh? See? And that's amazing. You see, these prophets were 
Oh, I think Isaiah of Jerusalem must have been a tremendous... I'm waiting to meet him when I go to glory. I want to shake his hand. And I want to thank him for his humility of spirit. Because imagine getting Isaiah 53 to write. And it, you have an inkling what it's about, huh? But you haven't a clue, really. You have an inkling that it's about God's Messiah. You have an inkling there must be something in your heart when you're a poet like that and you move in the realm and the depth of Hebrew poetry and revelation in the Holy Spirit. It must have been a moving experience for Isaiah to receive the words uh, of Isaiah 52, 53. You think when he finishes, sat there exhausted, and you think, Lord, that is absolutely fantastic. I wonder what it's all about. <laughs> you follow what I mean? And yet it's included. You know, you, I'll tell you one thing we forget. I'm going to talk about this uh, in a minute. One thing we forget about these biblical writers is they were men, as well as godly men. And they made choices. You know, this morning I got up and I said to my wife, what shall I speak about this morning? And as usual, she said, I don't know. <laughs> and I sat down after breakfast. I was late because I was very tired after last night's meeting and the week we've had. And I slept in this morning and I got up and I was like a bear with a sword. I said, oh, dear, dear. I meant to be up at six o'clock this morning to receive the word of the Lord. And as I was just having a cup of tea, the Lord said to me, just speak about the river in Ezekiel. That's all he said. See? And I said, Lord, I don't want to speak about this. So I got all my old notes out and I actually decided to speak on faith this morning. And then I scrapped that idea and decided to speak Genesis 1 this morning. Then I scrapped that idea. See, I was through a few ideas and it was only by a hair's breadth that you got Ezekiel this morning. <laughs> now, you see, you probably think these are such mighty men of God, they have absolutely no doubt. They get the word of revelation that comes zooming in. They're totally positive. I didn't know that I'd absolutely to speak in Ezekiel 30, 47 this morning until I stood on my feet and spoke in Ezekiel 47. When I preached last night, I didn't even have a sermon to the moment I stood on my feet. I wrestled right through the opening praise. I had not a word from the Lord. Huh? You follow that, huh? Not even a glimmer of a word. And yet I find afterwards that the Lord has given no end of other people the witness that I should speak in Ezekiel the river this morning. What's God up to? <laughs> I mean, Isaiah must have felt like that. And yet the great thing is, you see, I have to make choices. When the Lord said, <coughs> speak in the river in Ezekiel, after all my investigation and my tea and my Colgate toothpaste, I said to my wife, I think I'll speak in Ezekiel the river this morning. And that sounds a very human kind of statement, you see. And I thought, I'll just speak in Ezekiel 37, 47. Ah, oh, well, that's handy. Okay. I'll just speak in Ezekiel 47. And I came up to the, to the hall this morning. I said, I think I'll speak in Ezekiel 47. And uh, I made a choice to include it in my corpus, in my canon, in my book. Do you follow what I mean? Isaiah got Isaiah 53 and he sat with it with Berach. He, he thought, no, it wasn't Berach, it was the other fella. He sat and he thought, well... I wonder if I should include it or not. <laughs> you see the humility, huh? The man, he couldn't have known all that it meant. He couldn't have known all that it meant. And yet because of his humility, his faithfulness and his open and the mystery at the heart of his religion, today we have got something that we know what it means in living power. See, that's progressive revelation. It's God revealing himself so that people understand it, but also saying something that's beyond their present experience, but is for generations yet to come. Don't you think that's marvellous? Yeah. I think that's exciting. You see, I hope that, uh, you know, I hope even kind of me shouting at you about the Bible gets you enthusiastic to look at it a bit more, because we're dealing with something here that is so tremendous. Huh? So tremendous. You have to feel the mystery and the privilege of it and the reality of it and, and these men of God to whom we owe. So, it's progressive. That's the first point of Revelation. It's progressive. And if you don't read your Bible with that in mind, you'll trip yourself up terribly. <laughs> there are some folk who read their Bible and take all of the Bible as though it's for you today. And that is not the case. <laughs> of course, God can take any verse out of the Bible and make it turn its head and apply to you today. But I'm talking about the consistency of the revelation. When we see the progressive nature, we understand what the Apostle Paul meant when he said that the law had been our school teacher to bring us to Christ and that some things had faded into the background. And Paul, the great rabbi, in his own Christian teaching, contradicted the very fundamental principles of his rabbinic training. His rabbinic training had told him to be a jot and a tittle with the law and to have very, very strict attitudes towards food in certain categories and yet he found himself writing all things that to be received from God with thanksgiving. That's progressive revelation. You see what I mean? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, secondly, this is point three. 
point, this is number three, point B, okay? It's historical. Historical. What I'm really delighted about is this. The Bible does not start once upon a time. Hmm? Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. Hans Christian Andersen did not write the Bible. In other words, it's not a fairy tale. Huh? Hey, I could give you, you know, I think I've told you that, you know, my old academic background was in literary studies, didn't I? And I could give you a real hoot for a minute and de demonstrating to you the difference between the historical nature that the Bible presents itself in and what we call mythology or fairy tale. Now, very sadly, lots of Old Testament scholars treat the Old Testament as mythology. And instead of, in the beginning, God, they should start off once upon a time. But the Bible doesn't speak like that. It enters into the realm of human history from its inception, and it deals with its feet on the ground. It's the glory, it's the revelation of the glory of a divine being, God, in the realm of human history, time. And the tremendous thing about the scriptures is we have the revelation of eternity in the context of time. And that's why it makes sense to you and me. Huh? Because the great thing about the scripture is God is trying to disclose something that is utterly ununderstandable to human beings. Huh? But he discloses it in the realm of time, which is understandable to human beings. And so as we see God at work in time we begin to understand who God is in eternity. You follow what I'm after this morning, huh? You get the interweave of time and eternity. The God of timelessness becomes in the Bible the God in time. Hmm? And the great thing about it is it's concrete. That's why if you look at the Old Testament, I know many of you have d difficulty maybe understanding the Old Testament. What I mean by that is not understanding the words how many of you look, I, I sang the books of the Old Testament, I won't subject you to that misery again, but how many of you have had problems when you were younger, or even today, looking at the books of the Old Testament as they're presented in the English canon, and fitting them together with the events as they actually happened? Do you have difficulty with that? Well, I'll give you a little rundown then quickly, you ready? Get a little pencil and a paper, and I'll just give you a quick flip of history in the Old Testament, and I hope this will help you. You ready? Yeah, yeah right. Now... Before we go any further, this book that I'm about to tell you about has got seven chapters, all right? So one to seven, all right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll give you the chapter headings, and then you'll understand the periods of history, and then you can write in the books of the Old Testament that are relevant to the particular period. You got me? Huh? Because the problem at the moment is we've got the Pentateuch, Genesis, X, Leviticus, Numbers, followed by the historical books, right? through from Joshua to the end of 2 Kings. Skip Chronicles for a moment. I'll tell you about Chronicles in a minute because that's a particular problem. Then you've got poetical books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, followed by wisdom books. Well, Job's wisdom. We've got uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Sayings of the Wise, followed by the prophets. Yeah? See? And they're all in blocks like that and they've gathered the canon together according to the nature of the writing. You follow that? I've got at least uh, one person with a Jewish background here this morning, and she will uh, uh, say with me, witness to you, that that's not how the Hebrews gather them together quite, is it? Huh? I mean, they did the writings, but some of the things we count as history, they had in the writings, and they put them together in a different thing. Huh? See? They had the Torah, uh, the, I don't know, the Ketuvim, the Nevi'im, something like that. Yeah? Okay? That's good enough. All right. I won't get her to say it authentically to you. Now, see... The first chapter of biblical history, you want to write the beginnings, okay? The beginnings. And the first chapter of biblical history only takes up the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Genesis 1 to 11 are about the beginnings, about the creation of the earth, about the creation of man, about the fall of man, about uh, the flood, about the Tower of Babel, epoch-making events. They've got no date fixed to them, albeit the Archbishop Usher wanted to fix them in 4,000-something BC at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's a bit stretching the imagination. It doesn't matter. It's of no importance. But they are epoch-making events huh? called the beginnings. The first chapter of the Bible is the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. The second chapter, you want to write down the patriarchs. That's P -A -T -R -I -A -R -I what do you say? Patriarchs. A-R-C-H-S. Patriarchs, okay? <laughs> Can't spell. Now, 
I used to set a little paper in London Bible College when I was head of the Department of Old Testament there for people who were students and were wanting to be students. And we had to set a little paper uh, to see if they knew anything about the Bible at all. Sadly, most of them didn't. But um, it was ever so interesting because one of the questions I used to put was to put a few names down and tell me what book they occurred in. And one of them was Moses. Huh? And you know, 75% of all students put Moses in Genesis. Huh? Oh, don't be horrified. I'll try it in you if you want in a minute. <laughs> if you don't catch it, Moses, I'll catch it another one. The second chapter of biblical history is the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, who are from chapter 12 to chapter 50, the last chapter of the book of Genesis. Huh? Moses isn't until Exodus, huh? right? So chapter 1, Genesis 1 to 11. Chapter 2, the patriarchs. See how... You'll see there's more books become associated as we go on because Revelation gets wider. Huh? See? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, chapter 2, Genesis, chapter 12 to 50. In chapter 3, we've got Moses and the Exodus. <coughs> and there are three books associated with that. Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. Huh? In Exodus, the covenant is made, the law is given and the tabernacle is built. Exodus. In Leviticus, the priests and the people receive religious instructions. And in Numbers, the Israelites are prepared for their ultimate purpose. I don't know why in Latin we called it Numbers, Numeroi in Greek. I don't know why we did that. Because in Hebrew, it's Bar Midbar. It's in the desert. It's the story of the experience of the people wandering in the wilderness. But Moses in the Exodus, right up to the plains of Moab, before they enter into the land. You've got the picture, haven't you? <laughs> From Egypt to Jordan, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, chapter 3. It's ever so easy, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I tell you, it gets harder. Now, now, just before we go on here, you might say to me, well, what dates are we talking about? Well, chapter 1, I can't give you a date. Huh? I can only tell you it's historical, but I can't tell you what time in history, right? From the beginnings to that point. Chapter 2 with Abraham, we're talking about round about 2000 to 1800 BC. Round about 1800 years before Christ. With Moses, we're probably talking about 1300 to 1200 BC. Say 1250 for a mean. 1250 years before Christ, okay? So we're coming down. I find it quite significant that the datable time of revelation starts with Abraham at a period before Christ that is pretty equitable to the time that we are now after Christ. Huh? You think about that and draw your own conclusions. But I find it very, very interesting. Huh? Uh, just say that for the moment or you'll think I'm extreme. Now, <laughs> number four, chapter four, is what I would call the conquest and the settlement. You know what happened? Under Moses, the people come out of Egypt. They go straight up there to a place. In, oh, here's what I want you to do for a minute. Let's have a little game. Can we do that for a moment? Let's see how good you are in your imagination. I'll turn around this way. I want you all to think in your imagination. You're going to think that you've got a bit blank bit of paper in front of you. Have you got that? Yeah. And in your right hand, in your imagination, you've got a black felt tip pen. Have you got that? Right. Here's the bit of paper like this, okay? So from about a third in from the top left, have you got it? To about a third up from the bottom left, have you got that? I want you to draw a wiggly line down that way with a little bump at the top, which is where Mount Carmel is, and come right down to the bottom there to where Philistia is. Okay, that's the sea. The Mediterranean's in the blank bit up at the top there, and inside is some land. Have you got that? Hallelujah. Down, now, down the bottom is, is the wilderness, okay? Then go about a third in from the right-hand side and come down about a third into the middle of the paper. Have you got it, yeah? You imagine this? Draw a little inch long wiggly line and then a little circle like that. Have you got it? And then another bit of a little wiggly line about three inches long and then a big long kind of rectangular circle like that with a little wiggly line under it. Have you got that? No, no wiggly line under it. Just that. Have you got it? <laughs> At the top, we've got the River Jordan coming into the Sea of Galilee, the River Jordan going down into the Dead Sea. That's your lot. Have you got it? So that's a good, isn't it? Now, <laughs> now, you see, now remember that. You've got it in your mind, have you? Have you got it there? Moses and his mob come out of Egypt up through the bottom of your paper. Have you got it? Here they come. Boom! <laughs> you see? You got that? They didn't come over the Red Sea. Not the Red Sea like the Gulf. You know, that's too deep. You know, they came through the Yom Suf, the Yam Suf, through the, the Sea of Reeds. Uh, well, I'll give it that some other time. Did you know that? It was really in the north coast, really, of the Mediterranean. It wasn't really a way down there at all, because if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. Now, they come through here, God does a miracle, leaves the Egyptians buried in the mud, and on come the Israelites with Moses and his mob up through the bottom of your paper. 
and they're coming up between the wiggler line on the left and the Dead Sea on the right. Have you got that? Yes. And they just hit the bottom there at a place called Kadesh Barnea. You got that? Yes. And there was palm groves there because it was a spring. And they camped there for a little bit, didn't they? You remember that? And Moses did whatever a good leader. He sent some spies in. Do you remember that? Huh? Yes. Up from Kadesh Barnea, up between the Dead Sea into the Promised Land. And they all went there and had a great old wing time of it. Ten of them saw giants and two of them saw giant grapes. Do you remember that? Huh? <laughs> and they all came back and the ten said, Oh dear, oh dear, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. You ought to see the size of the giants. We'll never do it. And Caleb and Joshua said, The grapes are marvellous. Do you remember that? Huh? Well, anyhow, the people listened to the other mob and they left Joshua and Caleb to it. So instead of going straight into the land, which is what God wanted, the shortcut, <laughs> Like all good human beings, they took the long way around. Eh? And here's the Dead Sea. You've still got it in your bit of paper? They came round the bottom side of the Dead Sea, crossed over there into the land of the Edomites, and went up the back side of the desert. What a long way around. If you've ever been there, there was no motorway then, you know. It was dreadful walking. And for 40 years, they wandered around the blazing heat. It's the most terrible place in the whole world. And they ended up, now you watch your bit of paper, have you got it? They came right up the top of the Dead Sea, and just go two inches up from the top of the Dead Sea, there's a flat bit in your paper. Do you notice that? And if you've been away ahead of me, just in from there, you put a cross and you called it Jericho, did you? You got it, yeah? And you put a little wiggly bit for some hills here called the Hills of Moab, and your flat bit that's still in the paper, don't let it come out because it shouldn't, it's flat, it's called the Plains of Moab. And there they are sitting on the Plains of Moab after 40 years, at the end of chapter 3, eh? Huh? That's where Leviticus and Numbers take you. You got that? And you come to chapter 4, and that's the conquest, because they crossed the Jordan. And the books that are associated with that are the books of Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, huh? aren't they? <coughs> Deuteronomy prepares them to cross over, Joshua is leading them in the crossing over, and Judges is the sorry tale of how they didn't quite get it right once they were there. <laughs> oh boy. I like mental images, don't you? helps you. Now I'll give you a mental image of the book of Judges just to keep you happy for a minute. I've got a little picture for every book in the Bible but I haven't timed this morning. Look, 20 past 12 now. We're only at point three now. <laughs> the book of Judges is great. Have you ever been in hospital? Yes. Have you ever walked up a hospital ward and you've looked at those little charts that hang over the end of everybody's beds? That's the book of Judges. <laughs> it is. They go up and down and up and down and up and down. And up. God takes the temperature one minute, it's up, the next minute it's down, you know. Says the people did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of the Midianites, Judges 6. Oh, then the Lord raised up a, a deliverer called Sa a Gideon, and he delivered them out of the land of the Midianites. Then he put them into the hand of the Philistines, and God raised up Samson to deliver them out of the hand of the Philistines. I go, woo, 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 like that. That's the book of Judges, eh? <laughs> Chapter 4. Oh, dear. <laughs> Chapter 5, the establishment of the kingdom. The book of Judges ends with a pathetic scripture. It says there was no king in Israel in those days and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Do you remember that? Yes. <coughs> God gave them a king. Of course, like every other good human being, they chose the wrong one. They chose the good looking one. Be very careful to look at the heart. You females, watch what you're doing. It's us ugly mugs that will get the best inside, you know. <laughs> and the books of the monarchy, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st Kings and 1st Chronicles. I'll come to Chronicles later. But first and second Samuel and first Kings, huh? the establishment of the monarchy. Of course, the great figures then are the figures of Samuel, Saul, and David. See, it's easy, isn't it? You gather it round a focal. There's a lot more in those books than what I'm telling you, but you gather round a focal point in your thinking, and you can put it all into order. Chapter 4, chapter 5, the establishment of the monarchy. Samuel, Saul, and David, the man after God's own heart. Do you remember that? That was around about 1000 BC, 1050, something about that. Then chapter 6, we have the division of the kingdoms, because David's son was Solomon, and Solomon's own wisdom tripped him up. Do you remember? That's why the, the great book of Proverbs says, with all you're getting, get understanding. Huh? He had a lot of wisdom, but in the end, his wisdom killed him. Hmm? What happened to the death of Solomon? What happened to the death of Solomon? What? Civil war. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. That's right. The kingdom was divided. Now this is the exciting bit. Watch this for a minute. From Moses right through 
We have the experience of the people of God in a straight line like that, okay? I want you to think of a tuning fork for a minute. You got it? This tuning fork has got a great long stem and short legs. <laughs> From Moses right through, you have the line of the people of God in Revelation, right through to this point at the death of Solomon. And then instead of one line, you have two lines, like the legs of the tuning fork, right? Have you got it? Yeah. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, what you've got to do is see a bit of paper. Are you back in your imagination for a minute? Yeah? yeah? And just for the sake of convenience, just go above the Dead Sea a little bit in the wiggly line, okay? And take your pen and come across like that and down there a bit to the coast. Have you got it? Yeah. Because above that line is the northern kingdom of Israel. It's called Israel and it's ten tribes more or less. Yeah, more or less. And the little bit underneath is called Judah, which is two tribes more or less. Yeah? Not the size of a decent Scottish county. Now, northern Israel goes on there, see? And Judah goes on there, right? But a great tragedy occurs because in 721 BC, Sargon, the king of Assyria, comes and in your little bit of paper up there in the middle, halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, just a, an inch or two into the middle blank, but put a dot and call it Samaria. It was the capital of the city of the, of the, of the tribes of the north. And the king of Assyria came and he blew them away. He took them away, right? And there was no longer tent. So your top line takes a nosedive 700 years before Christ into oblivion. And from that moment, all you're left with is one little line called Judah. You got that? See? So the divided kingdoms runs from about 930 BC, say, through to 721 BC, and the northern kingdoms disappear. The other bottom line called Judah goes on for a while, okay? Until in 597 BC, the Babylonians, they had taken over from the Assyrians by then. The Babylonians under the great king Nebuchadnezzar come against Jerusalem and they take away the chief rulers, the king, the priests and all the government officials. And that's how Ezekiel ended up in Babylon. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. Ezekiel was in Babylon prophesying the downfall of Jerusalem. He was taken away as a priest in the first movement of exile in 591 BC. Ten years later, because the Israelites played hooky with the Egyptians, the Babylonians came back and this time, instead of just taking a few of them into exile, they burned the city flat and they destroyed the holy city. And all of them went into exile at that point. Have you got that? So, we have a line that runs from the death of Solomon, two lines, one disappearing in 721, and one disappearing in 597, 587 BC, into Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept, and our captors said to us, the required of us, sing us one of the Lord's songs of Zion. And we said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Isn't it tremendously heart-searching? When you have a proper view of the Bible and how it works, you see how even the Psalms slot into place? Eh? There we hung our harps upon the willow trees. Eh? How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? In the thirtieth year I was with the exiles by the river Kiba, and I saw visions of God. <laughs> you got that? Now, if you take the history I've just given you there in six chapters for a moment, before I finish in seventh chapter, if you take that history, you can take your Bible and you can fit, take all the prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then the book of the Twelve. It's called the book of the Twelve because the Twelve prophets, we call them the minor prophets. It's a mistake. They weren't any less important than the big ones. We only call them the minor prophets because all of their book fits on one, on one scroll, see? It takes one scroll of papyrus to hold Isaiah, one Jeremiah, one Ezekiel, one Daniel, and you've got the book of the twelve. All twelve are on one scroll. But you believe me, their message was mighty powerful. Hmm? Now if you look at what they're saying and take your Bible and get a lion hand book of the Bible, you can fit every prophet into what I've just said, except those who were after the exile, that is Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi, yeah? You can see that the word of God is totally appropriate to every movement of history. And you'll take your Old Testament as you have it, you'll use the first bit to paint the scene, and then you'll take the Psalms and the Prophets 
and you'll fit them in to the scene as they occur and it'll make an awful lot more sense to your Bible. Hmm? Do you see? You'll understand what Isaiah was about. The dates are there because the books of Kings relate to the prophets. Huh? The prophets are mentioned in the book of the Kings. You say, well, what about Chronicles? No, I didn't mention Chronicles, did I? Has it ever confused you, Chronicles? No? <coughs> well, three of you, right. The answer to Chronicles is this. The books of Kings were written before the exile as the record, if you like, of how God's dealing with the people. So they're very early. The book of Chronicles is a rerun of the same history. Have you noticed that the books of Chronicles repeats the books of Kings? Have you? But have you noticed it does it differently? What's the difference? Well, the chief difference is this. If you take David, for example, in Kings you get David, warts and all. In Chronicles you get him painted in a rather more perfect picture. He's not, some of his kind of uh, more earthly side is rather kind of... Uh, the reason is this, that the books of Chronicles were not written at the time of the events huh, or near them. The books of Kings were written near the time of the events. The books of Chronicles were written after the return from exile. See, that the Jews were in exile for 70 years huh, in Babylon. Then God called them back. You can read the story, the history of that you get in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. See, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah will tell you about the return of God's people back, what happened, what they found when they came back to Jerusalem. After that, and in that period, the books of Chronicles were written, which are looking back, if you like, they're looking back to what happened, and they're reviving the people's hopes under the Holy Spirit as to all that God has done. And it's more like a kind of concentrated version of the history, yeah? And it puts the emphasis on all the big spiritual movements. The great story of Josiah and his revival. Of David and his perfect kingship. And all the things that are meant to revive the people's hopes into the purpose of God. Do you follow me? And so the book of Chronicles goes over the same ground as the books of Kings. But it does it with a different theological purpose. Eh? You follow me? The books of Kings are more prophetic than the books of Chronicles. The books of Chronicles is more retrospective than the book of Kings. The books of Kings are more... As it happened, when it happened, just after it happened, the books of Chronicles are like a sermon that are given of the history of God's people to revive their hopes now that they're back to build their land in the power of God. Huh? You follow that? Now lastly, chapter 7. It's called Exile and Restoration. The Exile and Restoration, that last period. You can read about the text of the Restoration in 539, about 540 BC. You can read about the text of, of, of Restoration in Ezra chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, where Cyrus, because by then the Persians had taken over from the Babylonians. First it was the Syrians, then they were taken over by the Babylonians, then came the Persians. And Cyrus was the great Persian, of course. And the Cyrus, the Persians had a different viewpoint from the Babylonians. The Babylonians took people into exile and kept them subjugated in exile. The Persians believed that the best place to govern their empire was back in the people's own homeland. And so they sent the Jews home. And you get the story of that restoration. And Ezra and Nehemiah are the two books that tell us most about that. And the great prophets of the restoration, of course, are Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. Huh? Okay? So, that's the Old Testament, if you like, in seven easy steps, and you can put it in. Now, I want to say two things, just in closing. I'm two minutes over time. Can you, can you hold it? Yeah? Yes. <coughs> Revelation is progressive. Revelation is historical. And when we understand the historical nature of Revelation, we can begin to understand how God has done it. Revelation is human. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean that it's not godly. I mean that the language that's used and the culture that's used and the ways of speaking that are used, God uses human vehicles to speak them through. That's nothing to do with being sinful. It's nothing to do with being flawful, full of flaws or anything. It's to do with the fact that God speaks into real situations through men who are anointed by the Holy Spirit. Huh? So you find, for example, that in the Bible, God is spoken of as having... In, in what we call anthropomorphic language. Anthropos, man, morphic, as, like, you know, in the image of. Anthropomorphic language that speaks like as though it was a man. God's got nostrils, he's got ears, he's got hands, he's got feet. He sits on a great throne, a whole lot of other things. I want to plead with you this morning. 
many people who are liberal approach the Bible and poo-poo it because they think, oh, that's a, a very old-fashioned idea of God. Huh? God reveals himself in that way because it's the only way that human beings can even start to understand the majesty of God. Huh? And I want to plead with you this morning not to be a literalist with the Bible. Now that may surprise you. I mean, you take the truth literally true. But what I mean being literalist, you get awful pedantic. You have to be poetic with the Bible. Hmm? You have to let God speak breathingly. When God speaks, for example, of the finger of God, you and I would be quite happy if all that he meant was a finger. Do you follow me? The finger of God. Jesus used the very image and it's used in the Old Testament. The finger of God. If we were being literal and we thought that what was going to happen was an index finger was going to come and point at us, I'd be perfectly happy with that. I could, I could handle that. But I really know that the metaphor, finger of God, speaks of something that's much more powerful, searching and changing than just a, an index finger. Huh? You follow what I mean? In other words, I think we've not got to think of God in limited terms. God uses limited terms to speak of what is illimitable. Hmm? In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. You think God wears a big robe and lives in a gold temple? Of course not. You just have to listen to the, the language of Isaiah and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and you can tell that he's trying to express what is inexpressible in its glory. Eh? And God is busting human language to its extreme. But he's using human channels to speak to human beings. Eh? That's good, isn't it? Lastly, it's infallible. Infallible. What do I mean by infallible? <clears throat> the word infallible means it's, it's, it's true doesn't make mistakes and I believe we have to say that that's true see because we're scientific today many people look at the Bible and say it's wrong for example it speaks of the Sun rising the Sun doesn't rise it's the earth that goes round the Sun what a stupid small-minded way of looking at life eh? I say the Sun rises don't you because that kind of language speaks of the apparent hmm? see and you know We've got to distinguish, when we speak of the, the infallibility of the scripture,